and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, we are very lucky to have Muhammad Ali Agel here with us, who is a Shopify slash e-commerce uh, magnate, I think it's fair to say. I got connected with him through some connections with Shopify, uh, and he is going to be speaking at the upcoming Facebook Mastery Live in Berlin, as well as Affiliate World Asia, and he's also producing a uh, acceleration module for the Facebook Masterclass that I'm really excited about called e-commerce rapid prototyping where he's using his perspective as both a successful affiliate and a successful e-commerce guy to combine for the ultimate short module in e-commerce for our affiliates. Welcome to The Robust Marketer today. How you doing, Mohammed? I'm good. Hey, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for watching this. I'm, uh, I'm excited to this uh, interview. Yeah, no, it's, uh, we've, we've always had a good time chatting so far, so I, I don't think this will be any different. So Absolutely. The thing I like to start with in these podcasts is what I call the marketer's hero's journey. How did you come to where you are today? Tell me a little story about, uh, about where oh. you are and how you got there. Okay, so uh, the story basically begins, what, 10, 11 years ago? So I was chilling back home in North Africa and Tunisia, and then um, I got my high school degree, and then I came to Canada to study. Once I'm in Canada, I was like, uh, yeah, this whole like weather needs to be someone working at home. Literally, that's how it started. You didn't want to leave the house, basically. <laughs> Pretty much. Like someone who didn't grow up in a Canadian winter. Uh, when you when you're like you face the Canadian winter the first time you're like yeah it's good and all but let's just stay home yeah and uh, that with the fact that I honestly grew up like doing you know the the side hustle yeah back home so I always was selling something I always was selling something like since I can remember I had always money in my pocket selling something to someone and I was doing arbitraging since forever like since literally. I was a kid, like we would buy stuff for cheap and sell them for a higher price, which is pretty much what I do today still, but on a big, like on a higher level. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, I started, uh, I started in 2010. I started back in the days there were forums, like forums were the thing. And uh, I started with SEO and offering SEO services and whatnot. And uh, basically I started making like some good money. Uh, after that, Google slaps like penguins and uh, I don't know what they call them, uh, Google penguin and Google updates and Google like all black and white animal you can think of. Probably they have an update for that now. And uh, I lost everything. So I was making some good money. I uh, And uh, I was young and foolish. Uh, I had credit cards for the first time of my life too. Okay. And uh, it was so nice like spending the money, but the money is still in your bank account, right? Because it's just a credit card. So uh, growing up, we didn't really have the credit cards back home. So that concept was still new to me. And uh, long story short, I ended up losing the SEO business altogether, uh, not paying my rent, being kicked out, sleeping on the street for like three days. It was in Montreal in uh, Canadian winter. And uh, yeah, then I got back to nine to five and that the worst was the worst time of my life. What were I you doing nine to five? Uh, nine to five, I was working in a in an IT uh, corporation that I don't want to name, but it's like the one of the top five in Canada. I w it was really a good job, suit and tie every day, like Mr. Agal, Mr. Agal. I was ended up being like a, a team leader or a manager, or whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, so and I hated it every day, to be honest with you, because you see, like you're going every day doing something that you hate, and you know you can do much more. And you're just working for the man. And I honestly hate that. So there is no way, like, I didn't see myself doing that for the rest of my life. And then um, what happened is I, uh, I went from that, well, I was working on that, on that. I was actually, and I was a good employee. Like, uh, you know, when they do the rating at the end of yeah. the year, I had like over 100%, literally over 100%. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had 107%. Jeez. <laughs> so, Above and beyond. I mean, it was so easy that I had like so much free time at work and I was working on my own stuff. So I started learning about CPA marketing. That was in 2012. So we started working on CPA marketing. Like I started learning as much as I could and uh, I started uh, promoting on Facebook. And uh, the rest was history. So I started with CPA back in the days. I remember like you could target people with uh, the detailed or what we used to call it like the... 
not the broad targeting, like the the, the exact targeting. Okay. And uh, it used to be with a hashtag. It was so simple. Like when it's a hashtag, it's literally people who are engaged with whatever interest you're targeting. And uh, back in the days, you could write like Dr. Oz and uh, Oprah Winfrey and all of that. And it was so easy to make money with the CPA marketing. Like literally, you would. It's it was. It was uh, a classic to see like five to six X ROI or ROI in your uh, in your Facebook advertising. Then the of course the platform got better, let's say, and they start like weeding out all the bad offers and whatnot. And then 2014 or 13 it was. Uh, I shifted. Basically, I took all my knowledge in that CPA, and I think we will talk about that later. But I took all my knowledge, all the analytics that I learned, all how to read your numbers and all of that, and I switched to uh, selling T-shirts. For all selling... Teespring. Exactly. So I did like T-shirts on the platforms for two two years, I think, and then we started Shopify, like less than two years. It was a year and a half, a year maybe, and then in 2014, I started uh, Shopify, and in Shopify was a lot easier than CPA marketing because... The thing is, I took all what I, what I learned through the years and applied it to the e-commerce business. Exactly. And, uh, and the rest was history. Yeah, one chapter I forgot to mention because it's like it was a roller coaster back in the days is I sold on eBay too. I was arbitraging on eBay and eBay ended up uh, banning my account and uh, PayPal holding $20,000 of my money that I have never seen. So yeah. Damn PayPal. So tell people where you are now. I think because I know you've, you've got quite the following going on Facebook now. But where what what are you like? You know that's your journey. But where are you now? You're you're now a, a, a top level uh, e-commerce person. Shopify recommended you as one of the biggest up and comers in the space, which has got to feel cool. So what I am now, I'm uh, I'm in a very blessed position. I would say I uh, I own e-commerce stores. I own direct response funnels, uh, building brands. Uh, speaking all over the world, helping other entrepreneurs, like doing private masterminds. I used to do consulting and coaching. Uh, now I just try to help as many people as I can, whatever, like all around the world. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. And I ended up building a following. Uh, that's a funny story about the following because it was never my intention. And it just organically grew. Like I received, honestly, like I can show you my Facebook account. I received like probably between five and 10 messages every three, four days, let's say a week, thanking me for whatever I'm sharing. And what you will realize is most people don't know what they don't know. Like it's it's second nature, if mm. not the first nature to me, what I do like marketing and e-commerce and funnels and direct response and all that, that I forget that the average Joe or people who are starting don't know what we know in our industry. So it's always like, and that's my message for people here listening. Like, don't don't underestimate what you know if you're trying to help people. Like, most people will not know as much as you know, and you will be surprised on how much you can help people all over the place. Even with little tips and tricks, it may change their businesses and their lives forever. And we're just headed to an era where it's just every everyone is moving, you know, online. I was just listening to a conversation uh, in a line the other day, and a guy was talking about a medical B2B product that he had. He's like, this year, I put a little effort into it, and it was 14% of our sales. He's like, next year, I don't think it'll be any less than 60, you know? And that's happening in every industry across the world. So this, it's like, when, when people talk about opportunities in this space, and, you know, everyone is always saying, oh, this is dead, or this is dead, or, you know, there, there's a lot of people saying that, but there's just constantly growing opportunities everywhere else. Absolutely. I mean, look at Amazon. They are buying everything and anything. Like everything is moving online. I, I know your your friends are with me on Facebook. So if you have seen my post the other day about the batteries that I was about to buy, and I was pretty much waiting online like for two minutes and the line was long. I just pull up the app and bought everything on Amazon and I left. In so, line? Yeah, I was in line. So basically <laughs> I was holding the battery. I put the phone. I was like, whatever comes first. And I have like the one click buying. So I just bought it. I put this on the shelf and I'm like, thank you. Goodbye. I left with that. Like, and the batteries came the next day. But uh, uh, like when it comes to opportunity and I get that question, a lot of people asking me if drop shipping is dead, for instance, that's like the biggest question we get in that drop shipping vertical. And when I say drop shipping, it's like a tiny percent of the whole e-commerce uh, ecosystem. 
So like people ask me, is dropshipping dead or is dropshipping going to be forever or is dropshipping a risky business or a stable business? Truth is like dropshipping is just a method of, uh, of shipping. Yeah. So fulfillment. What if, exactly. So if you fulfill from China or you fulfill from the US or you fulfill from your house or your own business is just how you fulfill or you fulfill from Amazon. Now, the question is, will people buy always online? Like, will there be more people buying online? The answer is absolutely. And I, uh, I encourage every business and every person to get online if they are not. And if you can help businesses get online, make them do so. And that creates even more opportunity like for the whole, for our whole industry, because that creates more offers, that creates more affiliates, that creates like more money for everyone. Everyone wins at the end of the day. What I'm really interested in is this whole movement to, um, cause I come from a, a performance marketing background and this idea of performance marketing, e even outside of e-commerce is something that I can see spreading to the point where, because as we live in a more and more trackable world, you're going to be able to track people's actions a lot more. And that the beautiful thing about e-commerce is that you're able to know who your customers are, know who your repeat customers are, know who your high ticket buy, you know, know that they've bought, know that something has happened. And I can see that spreading across the whole industry uh, as we get more sophisticated with, with sort of like action tracking or whatever, like how long until there's a, a, a Big Mac CPA campaign? You know, I sold a Big Mac and... And there, there it is. was can... there was there was always Walmart offers and McDonald's and Burger King offers on the networks. That's actually. right. Now the whether they were actually from start. those companies is another question. But <laughs> but, but you get the idea. Now yeah. uh, I think Amazon has a CPA offer, if I'm not mistaken. To well, eBay had. Uh, I remember back in the days, if you send an affiliate to eBay, they pay you like twenty five dollars, something like that. So that was actually uh, a performance marketing like kind yeah. of CPA uh, funnel. And uh, uh, there are now a lot of e-commerce businesses that are moving that way. So I think of an e-commerce business, and I know uh, your main audience is affiliates, think of e-commerce as owning your own offer. So in, in that, like, uh, in those keywords, you are moving from an affiliate being an advertiser. So you actually own the offer. And the technology with Shopify and whatnot allows you to actually have an army of affiliates promoting your store. Yeah, okay, now, so, sorry, keep going. Yeah, so uh, the biggest thing that I have seen in our e-commerce business and people are not actually leveraging, do you know how many like people blog for the sake of blogging and they are not monetizing their blogs and you can leverage all their social media and the social and all that organic traffic that they have? People who own email lists that they don't know what to do with, so, for instance, like if you are give me give me a niche right here, and uh, I will I will give you like a full plan on how you can leverage affiliates. Let's say beauty, and everyone now how it moved. Like if you follow the trend in our industry, it was uh, Facebook and still Facebook. Then you have like all the paid traffic, and then now it moved more towards like influencers marketing. That's the flavor of the month, I guess, or of this year. So everyone like pushing uh, influencers, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, etc., and Facebook fan pages. And everyone is forgetting about the organic traffic that you can also get from those influencers that own blogs that can be your affiliates. Like everyone thinking about the influencers, let's pay them, like pay them $500 or $1,000 or whatever it is for, uh, for a post. But what if you get that influencer as an affiliate? An so actual an per action where they're, where they're being... Exactly. Is this, have you approached people about this? This is something in my last job. We were looking at doing um, an influencer network and it's like, it's a less sophisticated space when it comes to that. So the people that we were talking to at that time over a year ago were saying, no, we want to be paid up front. That's our model. Whereas we were trying to say, well, don't you think it, you'd actually have more investment and you'd be more, you'd, you'd write a better post. And you know, if you were actually uh, incentivized in the proper way, if you actually had, had a cost per action, are you seeing that happening more and more in the influencer space? Uh, absolutely. What you need is case studies. What you need is case studies, so you can approach people that you know. It's it's all about human relationships with uh, with affiliates and approaching like treat them as a business partner. And also, what you can do is let's say we want to be paid up front. Like, don't go to the main guys first. Go to the smaller guys because they are easier to work with, and usually they are like one man show or one woman show. And it's easier to communicate with them, and they would love the idea. Like, you can ask them. 
can I uh, can I actually use your uh, your blog? Like, you just install a banner, and I will pay you monthly, either for that banner or we can pay you a commission on the sales that they bring. Mm. So, like, you, you know, there is there is that real estate, and it's up to you on how to use it yeah. as a media buy or as using that real estate as an affiliate. So the like literally the options are endless and you can use it to your advantage and there are not a lot of people using that to their advantage. And here is a golden nug- a nugget that probably no one is talking about is let's say there is a blog in your industry that is getting a lot of organic traffic. You can approach that blog owner to install your Facebook pixel on that. Ooh. And you can pay them. And then you can retarget them with your offer. That's interesting. So basically, they're getting like those 5,000, 10,000 clicks a day from Google. And you can check. Like, they don't have any Facebook pixel installed because people don't know. They are just passionate about that subject and they blog about it. Interesting. And basically, you can go, hey, we have this little code. Explain what the pixel is. Pick them. Like, go on Skype. Try to explain. And hey, I will pay you like... 300, 500 bucks a month. And this is not something theoretical. This is something that we actually did. Very, very it cool. Was, so you have all that organic traffic. And we all know that organic traffic converts like a lot better because people are actually searching mm-hmm. for it. And so imagine this. You go into a beauty blog. You read about, I don't know, like eyelashes or whatever. And then next thing they go on Facebook, they see an eyelash product promote like promoting your offer because you are retarget them and obviously the average joe will not know they will think oh the internet is following me yeah so. as they often do they, yeah every day i have someone else being like are they listening because i you know I, I did this test where i actually just talked into my phone and i didn't do anything else gave no other signals and uh, that's really i was actually just having a conversation with uh, one of my coworkers about retargeting and how few people even retarget how if you're an offer owner Retargeting is among the lowest hanging, like it's like the lowest hanging fruit you can possibly do. And so many people don't do it. I know. It's uh, retargeting is amazing because you already paid for that click. You already educated your customer, hopefully on your landing page. And then it's a matter of just being again in front of them. That's all. Like you are in the back of their mind. So for for instance, for e-commerce, we have a lot and it's the nature of the business. We have a lot of cart abandonment. And if you read the reasons of the cart abandonment, it's ridiculous. Like sometimes it's just your phone rang, you went to talk on the phone and then that's it. You forget about it. Like, you know, the many times I open a tab, then I like I look for five seconds and then I go back and I forgot what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. All so the that time. happens like ha- Imagine that happening in normal people life and the daily life and they are just people are busy. So they uh, they will see it. Let's say they will see your offer on desktop and then they will convert to mobile or their iPad when they are like in bed at night, you know, scrolling on that iPad and they see you again and they buy or they, they see you on desktop and they buy on mobile or vice versa. And they see you at work on mobile then they go home and buy on desktop. So that's another golden nugget that I want to give you is cross. Uh, cross uh, platform retargeting. Yeah, that's that's interesting as well. So, it, it, do you have any data on on which platform has performed best, or is it just sort of depends on the situation? Exactly, it depends on the situation. Depends on your offer, on your business, on what yeah. uh, promo you're doing, what theme you're using, the layout of your landing page, etc. It depends on a lot of things. The the only thing that you can do is test and know your metrics. Yeah. Know your metrics, and most importantly track everything like the first click versus the last click see what it starts like you can your first click can be desktop but the actual sale will happen on mobile interesting and you got to be able to follow that through as the same consumer on their journey so you understand it better so i wanted to back up for a minute about your journey into e-commerce first can you tell me what the first product you ever sold was do you remember uh well it was on ebay it used to be uh oh my god on ebay it was headphones okay on on teespring it was obviously a t-shirt it was about the montreal canadians oh perfect very canadian (laughs) of you and uh on uh on shopify on shopify it was uh it was a necklace okay it was a custom-made necklace and that was a funny story about that necklace oh my god 
So what I did, I was like, you see, I came back with the when I moved in Shopify, I came back with the mentality of uh, Teespring. Okay, people can pre-buy, like people can pre-purchase this before it's actually made. Yes. And I was like, let me, let me. So what I did is, I ordered the. So I went to Odesk. This is basically how I started the whole Shopify thing. Uh, I had a big, uh, I had a big uh, fan page on uh, Facebook book about pit bulls okay and i went to shop i went to alibaba and i was like hey i want to make this uh this uh, pit bull head necklace so it was a pit bull head necklace and uh, it's a custom design so i went to upwork and i got the design made for i think it was like 80 bucks and then i took that design to alibaba and i was like yeah i need 500 of those made so uh i i started getting like uh, different uh different uh, coats from different people and materials like we will make it stainless steel we'll make it zinc we'll make it, uh, make it silver gold and all of that and that took me about like three days to choose whoever i'm going to deal with and i ended doing like uh, necklaces for a uh, dollar 20. okay and then i was like well if i'm going to sell necklace a necklace and people will like it let me throw in earrings and bracelets so i added the same pendant I added it like an earrings and bracelets. And I was like, oh my God, no one will like no one will actually buy a pit bull necklace, but whatever. Like, what am I gonna lose? 500 bucks? So at least I tried it, right? And the rest was history. We actually did six figures with that necklace. <laughs> the pit bull necklace. So I was selling the necklace for 1999. This is the dog, by the way. This isn't the artist. This yeah. isn't Mr. Worldwide. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> This is the top. Okay. <laughs> so, so the necklace cost me basically dollar twenty, and I was selling it for nineteen ninety nine. It's a good markup. I'm like, this is amazing. This is amazing. And uh, basically, we added like a little bit to the packaging uh, to uh, to increase the perceived value and all that. So my AOV ended being like my average order value ended up being like $35 with the uh, necklace and bracelets. And we did like combos and upsells and whatnot. And my cost of that average order value was like $3 for dollars. So I was making like mad money with that. Wow. And, uh, here is the trick. I sold the first, uh, the first 500 necklaces before I even received them. You had the design only. Time. Yeah. I had only the image of the product on my Shopify store. The necklace was still in China. Wow. So how important was it? So back up even a little bit further. So you, A, do you just love pit bulls or you recognize this as a niche that was an opportunity? Here's the thing. I never sell things that I love if I'm the only one who loves them. So I keep my hobbies as hobbies. Yes. I don't mix my hobbies and businesses. I sell what people want. Yes. People are going to give me their money. It's not for something that I like, that I'm passionate about. Like, for, if you're selling something, I will not give you my money if I'm not passionate about what you're selling, right? So I don't see why people would give me their money for something that I'm passionate about. Let's say I'm passionate about, I don't know, like, uh, I, I want to choose a weird niche here that I maybe... We could use an example that I did earlier this week, which was my sneaker giveaway when no one really cared about the sneakers. This is something I was passionate about. And I, sh I brought it to you and I'm like, hey, what do you think of this, Mo? He's like, I think you should probably just give uh, like ad dollars or Facebook ad credits or whatever. And I'm I mean, like, but I'm passionate about mm -hmm. sneakers. And I know, right? So that's like the perfect <laughs> example. You you were promoting like the uh, the AUA and the Facebook course and all that. Yeah. And the audience is all affiliate marketers, is all business people, online marketers and whatnot. A sneaker may not be the best thing to give them if you put like that that dollar worth of sneakers into uh, whatever, like uh, Facebook ads or a software or a free trial or a free ticket or yeah. whatever it is, people will be more interested because they will relate to it. Yep. Same thing with e-commerce. And this is like the number one mistake that I see people do is uh, choosing a product that they like. And after they make that first mistake, the second mistake is they get emotionally attached to that product. Mm -hmm. So they keep on trying and trying and trying. And then when you ask them, why are you doing that? They go, yeah, because I love that product. But truth is, no one cares. Yeah. They want, if you want them to give you, to give you money, they need to love that product. That makes sense. So let's talk about the design. So this is another interesting thing. Your very first, a lot of people, I think, 
when they think they're going to get into into Shopify or e-commerce in general, that they're going to do something like Oberlo, where they're just going to flip something from Alibaba essentially that already exists, and they're going to try to they're going to try to just arbitrage that way. But I feel like that as an opportunity is a really sort of like baby step. And it's also it's it's going to be hard to scale with something like that. Whereas you built a product as one of your very first ventures in e-commerce. You said even though it only cost you you know 500 bucks, 800 bucks or whatever, you you basically started with your own product and had it built at Alibaba. Was that that doesn't sound like a complex process. It was pretty easy. It was pretty easy. It was actually three emails. Yeah, literally. So the first email, I can tell you, the first email was, it wasn't an email, it was a post job on uh, Upwork. And I had that YouTube video, I know, I'm sure you have seen it. I, I laid down the whole process. But the first one, I was like, I'm looking for, uh, uh, for a jewelry designer to design a new necklace. Literally, done. The designer, like they applied, I emailed one of the designers, she was in the US. And she was like, can you show me a couple of uh, prototypes that you like so we can model after? I sent her a couple of pictures. She sent me some sketching done by hand. And I was like, I want 3C or 3B. She did it. End of the story. I took that file. I went to Alibaba and I was like, yeah, I have this picture and I want it made. And this is just a general contact at Alibaba. You just based, there actually is. There's a yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know anybody. Okay. So in Alibaba, you have the, you have like, you can submit a request. And you submit a request and all the suppliers will jump on you. Okay. So I did my request three days later. One thing on Alibaba, don't ever put your uh, your phone number in there. Trust me. Shh. You will be getting like phone messages like crazy. Like my phone was ringing on WhatsApp and I'm like, who are these people? Yeah. And you see, hey, we are from this. We are from this factory. We are from, I'm like, oh God. So basically after three days, they will uh, answer you. Like they would start replying to your, uh, to your uh, post. And basically, you just need to ask them, you, you prepare your questions like uh, what material, how long it will take, how much is it? And everything is negotiable. Yeah. Everything is negotiable. I think they quoted me first like $3. I ended up doing it for $1.20. Wow. On your first yeah. product, you're pretty savvy on your first product. That's super cool. So because, how? Because I was used to eBay. Yeah. Because they're not so, professional manufacturers on eBay. It's it's just random sellers. Exactly. And everything everything is negotiable. And Well, I grew up in a country where we negotiate everything. So Tunisia, that, right? Uh, yeah, Tunisia. I'd like to go so, there. Absolutely. I will, I will invite you. We'll okay. go together. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, that's pretty much it. So, I negotiated that. I ended up with $1.20. I, uh, I basically, I was like, okay, I paid PayPal the money. They were like, we will accept PayPal. We know it's our first transaction. You don't trust us, whatever. We'll accept PayPal. So I PayPal the money. And I was like, to be honest, I was a bit hesitant because it's the first time I'm dealing with like someone that I don't know in Alibaba. And I was like, okay. And then I start pre-selling. I had the fan page and I posted the picture and I was like, who wants to buy this for $20? And I had like 250 comments on my image on my fan page. I was like, oh my God, I'm into something. People so sharing started, it to other people and... Dude, like the image didn't have a link. All what I posted, the image of the necklace that the supplier sent me from China. I was like, can you send me the, the, the image? And basically what they did, this is the whole process. So they made the prototype, they sent it to me here. And before they sent it to me, they took that image. And they were like, you need to approve it if you want to approve it. Because I'm one of those guys that hates selling something that I don't see it first. Yeah. So I'm like big on that because honestly, I wouldn't sell something that is not worth like that is not worth the money that people uh, are buying it for because karma and everything. I don't want to sell anything that that is like totally crap. So I always try to order a sample. Plus, on a marketing side, ordering a sample allows you to make like videos, photos, etc. So you have more uh, you have more assets to play with for the ads. So while the while my prototype was in DHL to come, I was like, I'm not waiting for this. I posted that on uh, my Facebook page, and uh, yeah, I had like 250 comments for people. I was like, I want this, I want this. Where can I buy it? I want this, I want this. And three days later, I received the the necklace in uh, Montreal from DHL, and basically I took like more professional images. I set up my Shopify store. I put it on the, on the store, and I went back to this comments. And I was like so excited about this. I was like, I'm into something. I replied to each and every one of them. 
uh, back in the days there were no message yet now you can message people who comment on your photo yeah back in the days you can only reply to that message so i replied to them and the first day we did like i think like 1500 bucks and that built my pixel organically and all that yeah. so it was uh yeah and that's how uh, it was and that's how we took it from there and we got the process laid down and that's it. So what made that such a good niche? I imagine it has something to do with the fact that people are very passionate about it, obviously, right? That people, uh, there's a lot of like, it, uh, pipples it, are, an un, excuse the pun, but they're underdogs, right? They're dogs that feel like uh, that the world is kind of against. And so the people who love them are really passionate about protecting them. And uh, so, so passion would be one thing. What else makes a really good niche? Okay, so how I went into the pitbull niche is basically how back in the days Facebook dictated how they do their algorithm. So like three, four, five years ago, fan pages were the thing. Like we were able to reach hundreds of thousands daily organically. Yes. And the more controversial your niche is, the better it is. So think pitbulls, uh, second amendment and stuff like yeah. that. So passion helps. Being controversial is even like a bigger thing. Yes. So if you have if you have a subject, if you have a niche that people are in for it or people are against it, if you have both of these people, the comment section is amazing. It's so a- they will be like arguing which is which each other, and you're just leveraging that for for your business. You could just make an anti pit bull necklace too, maybe just a big red marker. <laughs> <laughs> and you learn about that niche. Like I learned so much about pit bulls, and I have never owned a pit bull in my life. But I learned so much, I became like literally a pit bull expert. I know, like for instance, like cropped ears for pit bulls are a big no no. I know, like there are different kinds of pit bulls, and nice. so on and so forth, and what food they eat, and how you should train them, yeah. etc. And that led into a micro continuity pit bull newsletter. We were charging people basically four ninety five a, uh, a month. Yeah, it was four ninety five for like the price of a cup of coffee, and we were sending them a beautiful designed newsletter PDF file where they can read about pitbulls. Wow, pretty much stuff that they already know, but you know, it's just it's a magazine. Yeah, it's a magazine. So, and that magazine you put like Amazon links and stuff mm-hmm. like that, so you even you even like make more money when they click on these links because how Amazon works, if someone clicks on your link. And even if they buy something else, you still bank on that. So at this point, so so that one basically happened organically. You had a hundred orders on your first post that you made there. But now, so do you do you follow that formula still? Do you pick a niche, build up content, build up an audience, or are you yeah. able at this point you can just go to go right to product? I I grow impatient. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like now ads first day, ads first day. Like I I don't even like the I build probably the fan page five minutes before I run the ads. Yeah. Because you just need a fan page to run your ads. That's it. So let's talk ads for a second. So Mm -hmm. what, when you do, like, how do you know, what's your first, what's your test case when you launch ads? Like how, how much do you put into it before you know if you have something that you can build? Uh, okay. So there is a test phase and there, because there is a difference between when you're first starting and when you already have assets and leverage. Yeah. So most people that I see, I think they make a big mistake is uh, there are people who run after products, which is totally fine. But the problem is they would do, let's say, a product for women, like 45 plus, and then their next product would be like men 20 plus. So they don't stick to the same demo. And that's a big problem. Because if you stick to the same demo, you actually can leverage your pixel, your data, your messaging, your list, everything. Your learnings too, like what you learn about that audience as well. Exactly. And you can leverage that for your second and third and fourth uh, product. But most people that I see, they just jump around and that creates sense of instability and it makes your life harder even in testing. Now, let's say you don't have any of those assets and you're starting like from the get-go. Uh, I would honestly start with, uh, and here we may get a little technical, I would uh, always start with, uh, I love video ads. I love them. I just, it's, it's the most amazing thing I think right now on Facebook. So they're cheap. The with, views are cheap, relatively cheap still, right? Exactly. And it helps you also create more lookalike audiences. Like you have these video views that you can create retargeting based on them and lookalike audiences. I guess we'll get into that later. 
and uh, that's an asset that a photo ad or a link ad will not give you. So uh, yeah, so for testing, I start like with video ad, I would start with video views or PPE. In most cases, I start with video views and for the sake of checking if the actual ad will be engaging, if people are liking, if people are sharing, if people are commenting, and you can do the same thing with a photo ad. Don't get me wrong. Like yeah. if you cannot make a video, that's not a problem. Start with the photo ad and check the engagement. The engagement is key. Like you need an engaging offer. And when I say engaging offer, you can turn a bad product into a good product by changing the offer. And when I say offer, I'm talking free shipping, free plus shipping, uh, buy one, get one for free, uh, bundles, etc. So uh, yeah, so basically you check your offer if it's engaging or not. And then you go into full sale mode. Like if it is engaging, it should be selling. And then basically I would start my WC ads, my uh, website conversion ads, yep. and I would start like running traffic to that. And within the first $30, you would know if you will be actually selling or not. So what will happen is either people are like first cases, are, are people clicking or not? So if people are clicking, we're good. We will move to the checking the next thing. If people are not clicking, we have a problem in the Facebook site. Either the audience or the offer or the product or the link or the copy or whatever it is, we need to fix it on the Facebook side. Now, if people are clicking, are people buying or not? If people are buying, we're good. If people are not buying, where is it breaking up? Is it breaking on the product page, on the add to cart page, or on the checkout page? And then we check. If people are actually adding to cart, so we don't have a problem with the product uh, page because it does what it's supposed to do, push people to the add to cart, right? Uh, now, if people are not clicking on the add to cart, mainly there is a problem with your product page. It can be the price, it can be the copy, it can be the image, it can be the loading time that most people ignore. It can be anything in that product page. So check all the elements and install a heat map. Whatever you do, please install a heat map so you know what's happening. Like you don't run blind because there is nothing worse than running ads without tracking everything. You are literally a blind person, like in a high traffic street. You don't want to be that person. Trust me. You want to have every detail nailed down in your funnel or in your store or whatever you're pushing traffic to. So uh, basically, yeah. So you check your uh, product page and see if people are adding to cart or not. If not, fix whatever it needs to be fixed on your product page. Then if people are adding to cart are not buying, there is probably a problem with your cart page. I have seen, trust me, I have seen cart pages that will not only push you back from the cart page, but will actually like make you hate the whole experience. So you want your cart page like to be clean, straight to the point. It does only one thing, and one thing only is pushing people to the checkout page. Like I have seen people that they don't really optimize their mobile checkout page, where they add like different buttons: checkout with PayPal, checkout with uh, with uh, Amazon, checkout with Bitcoin, and you see all the buttons like all crumbling together, yeah. and you are on a phone, and you cannot actually do what you want to do. So uh, yeah, so basically you fix that, and then at the end you see what happening with the checkout now again you need to know where it's breaking so you can fix it because what you will hear most case like my product is not selling people are clicking but they are not buying uh, okay so you need to diagnose what is not working in order for you to fix it it's like going to the doctor step by they will step start, exactly like when you go to the doctor they would like they will start checking you your eyes your your throat, this, that, and ask you a question, what hurts you, where, and then they will push. So the same thing you do with your funnels, the same exact thing. Interesting. And that's basically how you fix stuff. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. So you want to go step by step. You want to, yeah, and, the, you, and you have to treat every part of the funnel. Yeah, you, you start with Facebook because that's where people enter your funnel. So you start that, you, you get your, your engagement, you get your clicking, you get people talking. And then from there, this is this is something I hear all the time. We have a guy who's actually in our office right now who's who's um, doing drop shipping. Basically, he he left a very stable job to just throw himself into this world. And he's a super smart guy, so I know he's going to figure it out. Um, but uh, he's having a ton of that right now, where he's getting people clicking, he's getting people talking. He's picked an item that is a bit a uh, higher ticket. It's like a forty nine ninety nine item, which I think might be a little bit high for this space. That's true. It's not a problem. Not even if it's if. If the perceived value of it is forty nine ninety nine, he has she should have no problem selling it. Interesting. Okay, so you don't necessarily. What about shipping? This is something I hear all the time too. How do you deal with long shipping times? Do you do you just 
Do you just work with vendors that have shorter shipping times? But I guess if you're working with China, you're going to have the same six week kind of shipping issues. Is there, is there any way around that? Uh, absolutely. So the problem with China, there are a couple of problems. Number one, you need to build a relationship with your supplier. That's like the most important thing, like in any other business. I don't, I don't know why people consider China as like a foreign planet and they don't talk with them. Uh, trust me, we have saved a huge amount of money just by building the relationship with our suppliers in China. So the problem with China is they will print the label and they will stick it on the envelope and it will stay like in the corner behind him for a week. So basically you have a tracking number, but the thing is not shipped yet. Mm -hmm. So that actually adds to the shipping time. Number two is they use different routes, like different suppliers use different routes and different uh, shipping companies to deal with. Even though everyone like use ePacket or DHL Express or whatever it is, there are different routes. So that uh, also like may differ from two weeks to three weeks to one week. So it really depends. Uh, what else you deal with? Uh, communication. Communication is super important with the customer because even if it's two weeks shipping time or three weeks, honestly, what the customer hates is being ignored, is not knowing what's happening. Mm. So what you need to do is you need to set up uh, an, like uh, a sequence, an after-purchase sequence, where you keep up with the customer. Okay, your product has been packaged. Your product has been shipped. Even mm. if you cannot do it like one customer by one customer, you can do it based on, uh, or how we call it, like based on averages. So you know on average, your uh, your supplier will send let's say after three days so day plus three purchase day plus three like after three days you go to your crm and you go okay send this email hey first name your product has been packaged it should be shipped it should be shipped like after two days two days later hey your product is shipped then in two days you should be able to have a tracking number so you upload that tracking number to your crm or they shop or something else you upload that and they will get an email. Your product has been shipped. Here is your tracking number. A week later, hey, you should have your product by now. We would love to have a review or whatever. So you keep up with your customer. You keep the communication up and that will save you a lot of trouble. That's very good advice right there. Um, okay. So this sounds like a t I think I might just retire from the uh, iStack training biz and open up my new <laughs> drop shipping store. I guess I could always do it on the side. One of the things I wanted to know, as you know, a lot of our audiences are a lot of my audience is affiliate. Uh, you come from an affiliate background. And this is, I've talked about this on this podcast before is the affiliate world, the affiliate media buying, the affiliate arbitrage world is a fairly small world when it comes to the broader world of like making money online essentially. And I think you probably get a lot of this in uh, e-commerce and you know, in Amazon and eBay and all this stuff. It's, it's a more accessible marketplace. You're not having to set up ad servers. You're not having to uh, code your own landing pages a lot of the time. And so what are, you know, to the hardcore affiliates out there who've done the pops, the mobile display, the email, like all these other things, I think there's gotta be some inherent advantages they have coming into the e-commerce space versus uh, a mom in the Midwest who, who may be jumping on the Shopify train. So what are, in your mind, the key advantages that affiliates have when they get into e-commerce versus maybe someone who's not as experienced? Uh, honestly, if you, ask, uh, if you ask any affiliate marketer and you ask him who will make more money on a network, like the advertiser or the affiliate, 100% of the time it will be the advertiser. And I think affiliates have skills that will allow them to be more successful as an e-commerce business than the mom and dad that own a, that own a, like a, an e-commerce business. The reason being is affiliates excel in customer acquisition. Like we know how to- Which is the hardest part. Exactly. Keeping the customer, like in my case, keeping the customer is not hard. It's pretty much communication. And here you have two schools like of, uh, of thoughts. You have people who will think getting the customer is hard, but keeping them is harder. And you have people who like getting the customer is easy, but keeping them is hard. So getting the customer for an affiliate is actually super easy because that's what we like. That's what we know how to do. Yes. We run ads, we acquire customers. We know our metrics. We know how to run traffic. We understand data. We understand pixels. We, we understand like that whole that whole world that the mom and dad shops don't know. And then 
the easiest way, I think, for an affiliate like to, to turn code to code as an advertiser is to starting an e-commerce business because, as I told you, like you have full control over what's happening in, in your business. Like you have full control over over your story, like your uh, your your offer page, or you want to call it your landing page, your funnels, your uh, average order value, your lifetime value, and the assets. Like you will own the data, you will own the, your pixel data, you will own your email lists. Yeah. Uh, you own everything, and you have full control. And uh, I think affiliates have a big, big, big leverage over the rest of the world because we know again how to acquire a customer and in most cases we acquire it at a profit yes they well they have to otherwise they don't because in the affiliate keeping the customer is not really part of the affiliate mindset you know for most exactly. most they just want a new customer they just they pass the customer to the advertiser and then they're done and I, and that's the big the big part of the equation that affiliates need to grasp onto is obviously uh, how valuable that customer is. And like you say, the value lies with the advertiser because they're the one that own the customer. So that even Absolutely. if they even on a particular affiliate offer, they, they'll they probably in the long run definitely make more money than the affiliates. But then that's not even counting the next product they build or then upsell or whatever they're able to do on the back end. And that's why I told you like when we test now, we leverage our assets. Yeah. So if I test the product, I just send an email, which is in most cases for free. You're paying for the CRM anyways. Yeah. So you like you you just send an email or you 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 leverage your retargeting audience, which is always cheaper than cold traffic, etc. And if you think about it, like if an affiliate think about it, when we have like on the networks a free plus shipping offer that pays you forty dollars commission, there is a reason they're paying you forty dollar commission. Yeah, I guess so because so, they're making money on it. Exactly, uh, you own the whole back end, and that's big. Yeah. Big back ends. That's what it's all about. Uh, <laughs> just like Pipple. Pipple knows all about that. Um, but uh, okay, so I think uh, I think this is this is going to be just fine. So now you've got a big schedule coming up here. You're going to be all over Affiliate World Asia. You're doing workshops. You're doing talks. You're coming to FBML. You're coming to our workshops after the fact. Uh, so people are probably going to get sick of you in a good way. <laughs> well uh we i'm getting i'm i'm actually all over the world for real for the next like three months or so from now till december amazing toronto i'm speaking in egypt uh europe like the affiliate world summit which i can't wait to attend in asia then we're doing the one in phuket and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm trying, honestly, I'm trying to help as many people as I can. Yeah. Because I think everyone should be online, uh, especially affiliate marketers. I'm trying like to get as many of them to try e-commerce as I can because they have the leverage, they have the expertise, they have the techniques, they know how to acquire a customer. Like anyone who knows how to acquire a customer should be owning an offer. As that, easy as that. That's that's a pretty good sound bite, sound bite right there, and especially when the, the because the whole other side of arbitrage affiliate marketing is the gray and the black hat, uh, you know, know, of stuff, and and that world is shrinking just because the platforms are getting smarter and smarter about it. They're they're setting themselves to to the task of getting rid of them. They're putting it out on their blog. Facebook just put out their blog about cloaking, uh, and so really, I think if, I think any, affiliates are feeling the heat. Being part of STM, which is you know this huge affiliate forum, uh, the, the amount of traffic that's flooding into Facebook, into the Facebook parts of the forum and into the e-commerce parts of the forum is massive. All the mods are talking about, they're all testing into e-commerce because they realize the sort of the writing is on the wall. But that's the good news for affiliates is that there, there is this inherent edge that you have as an affiliate. So the bottom line is just don't delay, I guess. A good friend of mine last week told me, we own knowledge, we have knowledge. Knowledge is powerful. Like knowledge that yeah. you gain from the affiliate world, even if you are not an affiliate, like even if you don't have good offers to promote or if Facebook is banning your accounts or whatever it is, you have that knowledge that you can take into e-commerce. Yeah. You have that knowledge to acquire customers that you can literally like set up a shop in two hours and go up to the races. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like... I can't I can't explain it in world how easy it is for an affiliate marketer to start e-commerce. Yeah. It's literally easy. Well, we're going to make it even easier with your upcoming 
acceleration module, rapid prototype, e-commerce. One thing I really wanted to ask you about was you've got such a good relationship with Shopify. You know, and we were, when we were in talks with Shopify, they instantly said, okay, no, you got to talk to this guy. He's, he's the man. How did you build your relationship with Shopify so well? Did you just get on their radar because you were doing so well, because you were bringing other, you were an affiliate for them, you were bringing other people to, to their store and you came on their radar that way? How did that happen? All of the above, literally. Nice. <laughs> So they saw your stores having huge sales. Then they saw, and and so you also made the pivot. Then, as you say, by building this audience sort of accidentally, because there's there's a, whenever you bring someone else to Shopify, there's that affiliate opportunity as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's super interesting. So, where what is your Facebook community for people that want to seek you out? Oh, it's called Always Listen to Mo Tribe. That's kind of my hashtag. Always listen to Mo. And the Facebook group is called Always Listen to More Tribe. It's facebook.com slash always listen to more tribe. So go check out Muhammad. Go check out his awesome following here. And that's just the best way to get in touch with you, basically, through Facebook, through that group. Uh, hit you up there. I would, uh, I would love to have you all in there. Uh, we give that community, like, tight. No, it's uh, the – I drop, like, daily tips. I know, it, like, yeah, you're in there. Yep. So – the tips, the daily tips. Some people message me and they said like, you need to pay for these tips, <laughs> whatever. But uh, we keep it, we keep it like honestly. I'm I'm working hard towards that community, and I want like to be the best, the next best thing on Facebook. Nice. So and how... turn as many affiliates into e-commerce as I can. I love it. How big is your team now? I wanted to ask. My team, you mean the team I'm working yeah. with, like for e-commerce stuff. Ooh, it's uh, probably what, like between everyone that we deal with for e-commerce, we have like 10 plus people. Interesting. Because we have the stable guys on payroll and we have the contractors, the people or... like contractors that we deal with, freelancers and whatnot. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on the Robust Marketer today. My last question is just one I'm, I'm just recently started asking people, like you're obviously a driven person and when you were giving your intro and you were talking about... Uh, the job, the nine to five job, that was a good job, but you hated it. This is something I think about myself all the time. Like I've been pushed to these entrepreneurial pursuits because if I had a government job, Victoria's a big government town. If I got myself a government job, a nice stable job, I feel like I'd feel more like existential stress about like wasting my life away. I feel like that would actually be more stressful than like the high stress world of entrepreneurial activities. So, but the reason that we do all these things is A, we're driven people. But the other I think is the peak experiences. We love I love having peak experiences, e eating at amazing restaurants or going on amazing adventures or, or things like that. What, what to you, or, or to give an example, what's a peak experience that you've sort of had yourself that you look at, you know, in the moment and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here. This, this is fantastic. My life has brought me here. Oh my God. Uh, that would be, whoo, where would that be? I didn't tell you I was going to ask it. I know. I'm like, huh? Uh, the peak experience, honestly, like I had a lot of them. And uh, my my best experiences would be when I'm overseas, whether like uh, last year, last year, like I did half the planet, which was amazing. I literally flew. I remember that was the craziest thing I did last year. I was in Jamaica and this was fun. I was in Jamaica. And uh, a week ago, like a week before I was in Jamaica, Arab Affiliate Summit hit me up and they were like, do you, you want to come speak on Egypt? And I was like, OK. So I went like literally three days of flying to get to Egypt, to speak in Egypt, and I had like a blessing in that country and uh, the pyramids and the desert and all that. But honestly, what, what I love, why I love what I'm doing is because of the sense of freedom. It's not actually the money, it's the freedom to be able to do whatever I want, when I want, with not like without having to ask anyone for permission. Nice. It's an amazing feeling. You just hop on a plane, Take the laptop. Okay, we're working from Europe today. Yeah, and you're being paid to do it in your case because you're building up this tribe. Exactly. It's fantastic. And uh, yeah, I, I honestly encourage everyone, everyone to to try and make it online. It's not easy, but it's super simple. And if I can give one advice to anyone, uh, try to choose one thing and stick to it until you make it work. Don't jump from one thing to another. And even now that you've succeeded, are you still basically mining the same terrain uh, over, like, do you expand your terrain over time as you have success in a specific area? Or do you sort of mine the same sort of audience uh, consistently? 
Uh, like business wise, so business wise, I try to now that I kind of like um, I feel comfortable with what I'm doing, like e-commerce and whatnot. So I jumped into the SaaS business, software as a business, and I have a software coming, obviously related to uh, e-commerce. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So I'm basically building a software that should be released soon, and I'm uh, like uh, it will do basically all the numbers for you. The, because that's what we base our business on and I will let you know when it's out so you will have an account there it's, nice. it's actually I'm actually proud of myself that we build that cool. trust me <laughs> and uh, yeah uh, and also I'm going like into investing try to invest in all over the world try to invest in this whole new cryptocurrency craze oh I'm yeah trying to understand that still nice and uh, real estate and whatnot so so, uh, yeah, but I have been, again, in this business for, what, now 12 years? And, uh, yeah, you can't just do a business. Well, you can do it, obviously, a lot shorter than I did. But my advice is take one thing, master it, and then move to the next thing. Yes. You cannot, like, start everything together because I try to do everything together and I failed miserably. Even now, like, when I take too many projects together, I end up doing nothing. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> I know what you mean. So, yeah. That per that feeling of paralysis when you have too much going on. Exactly. I know. Exactly. I know it's about like, that. It's like today going to buy a new phone. You have yeah. them like all lined up in front of you, and you're like, which one? Yeah. What's even going on? Anyways, <laughs> Mohammed, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pit bull is in the office today, and he wanted to just come on up and say a quick hello. This is this is Charlie here. He's my pit bull, uh, and I'm gonna make a. He's a woodle. He's a wheat and terrier cross with a poodle, and I think I might make a necklace out of him. Awesome. Uh, the portal the, the the audience are really, really passionate. Yeah, I think that's Ask probably... Ask me how it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mo. We'll, we'll be in touch soon. And uh, people want to find Mo, find him on Facebook. Uh, one, more, one more time, always follow Mo Tribe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me. And uh, always listen to Mo. And we'll see you in Bangkok. Yes, sir. Okay. See you later, man. Cheers. Bye.